Um, my name is Saba Nat. I'm from a company in the Midwest uh, called Mesh, and we do a lot with web components. Um, the company has been around for about two and a half years, and we've learned a lot of lessons. Uh, today, I want to talk to all of you about basically re-envisioning applications from the ground up uh, with a web, web components mindset. Um, and also, an important part of this talk is um, the fact that this is for an age uh, where apps need to show a lot of information, have a lot of data flows, uh, but also provide a great experience. So from the animations to the interactions, uh, just to the, the fundamentals of performance, uh, it's, it's really important. So uh, yeah, we're going to get into it. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, uh, I'm a designer, a developer, and uh, kind of a scientist and a researcher. Um, so my experience with web components goes all the way back into college um, from day one. So I basically did all of my college projects in like Polymer v.5, and then went straight into the startup space, uh, really solid, and just carried web components uh, the entire way. So I've really witnessed the evolution of it becoming you know, v0 to v1, Polymer uh, you know, all the way through its infancy and then into its maturation, and lit element uh, in all of its power and glory as it is today. Um, but yeah, so that's a little bit about myself. Um, so a focus of my company is not necessarily uh, building web apps that are just on the web. Um, a focus of my company is to actually augment and extend the lifetime of native applications by embedding web apps within them. Um, so basically think you have a native app. It's got three decades of code base. It's impractical to take that whole code base and rewrite it in web technology. That's just not happening, I'll tell you that. So we want to, in the short term, uh, embed functionality into the native app and um, you know, create benefit. So this is a difficult thing to do because native apps uh, have a lot of data. That data moves, uh, what's up? Everything good? Oh, sorry. I thought I heard something. So data apps have a lot of, or uh, excuse me, native apps have a lot of data and that data moves very quickly. So volume and velocity are up. Um, and so when you're building a web app that needs to deal with that, um, it's hard because when you have all this computation, all these data flows, you're gonna drop frames, your, your, your experience is gonna go down. So from a very top level, how do you maintain that experience but still allow and enable high levels of computation and data flow? Um, so those are some of the things uh, on this slide. Nice. We have two products at my company. It's called Pieces and Runtime. And together they form something of a embeddable cloud operating system and the entire presentation section of that, uh, those two products is all built on web components. Uh, and you can see here, we've got the native app layer, then pieces and runtime uh, are on top of that, and then you can extend those in the web and have them available in the web. So the benefit here is that, okay, you've got this native app, it does everything that native apps do, and now you also have a part of that native app in the web. Uh, really nice, really nice when you create features that are fluid across um, a multitude of environments. So we have our platform, it's called Runtime. And Runtime apps look like this, where you have two streams, those are continuous streams, um, from the database, and so Firestore or AWS, whatever it might be, and that's always streaming in. And then we have streams coming from the native apps as well. So large states just continually streaming in. Because we're dealing with a large amount of state, we want to make sure that we do a lot of this computation on web workers. Web workers are a great way to kind of buffer and get that heavy duty work out of the way. And then we gotta pipe that up to the main thread and okay, now we've got all this data and what do we do with it? So we have a couple of things, we'll get into them, but this is a, a fundamental high level. This right here is an application I built in college. It's a messenger and the intent was to have 20,000 people in a group chat, full data reactivity, 75% of the UI is just fully responsive. So indicators, visibility, typing, um, and this is all built with web components. We want to show some of the complexities of large apps at scale, um, making sure they're smooth, but also custom theming, right? Scope theming, um, push notifications. You can see this is operating in a, in a web view. Uh, this is an installable web app. Some of the, some, that's a virtual scroller right there, uh, optimized for web components. And then, of course, dark mode. You got to have that uh, these days, right? <laughs> yep. And so you can really see each of those cards there, they have different color themes. That's a really nice benefit of something called a shadow root. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. So scoped uh, theming and encapsulation, some of the benefit there. Um, 
Yeah, and this just kind of demonstrates, even in this dropdown, we've got scope themes per uh, item, and these are some of the uh, components that we have in the runtime platform. And this is actually archaic technology. Uh, our technology now, this is a year and a half old. Uh, we've got a really cool thing. I'm going to talk about it today. It's called a component controller model. But yes, responsive uh, design here. So on phones, you know, you pull it up. It's an instant app, and you can send your class a message. That's why uh, I built that in college. <laughs> that was great. All right. So Surma, uh, he's a web advocate at Google. He's got two great quotes I think are really relevant. Um, one. He says, he often sees people encapsulate their business logic into their visual components. Uh, and this is tied to the component internal state. And then number two is, when should you use web, work, or web workers? Um, always, right? Always, uh, web workers are fantastic. And the interesting part here is, in the current landscape of frameworks, this is very difficult. Here's current landscape. I've dealt with all of these. I've studied all of them quite in depth. And I can tell you I've had a lot of pain doing so. Uh, but today, I'm going to talk about two in particular that were the shining knights, and then what we learned from them and brought into our platform called Runtime. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this. We've got React, we've got Flux, we've got Redux, Angular, ArcGIS, whole nine yards. <laughs> All right, nice. All right, so the, the primary point is to um, you know, reduce external dependencies, right? So you don't want someone else to break your code. You want to break your code. So the first and foremost part of that is leveraging the evolution of the web. Uh, we talked about, you know, hey, the web has come a long way. Edge, looking great. Uh, so yeah, we've got a lot of great tools. And out of the box, we can leverage those to keep our bundle sizes small and just say, hey, let's just build on what's there. All right. Lit element, by the way, fantastic way to very quickly get into web components. You don't have to build them from scratch. Uh, you can for like extreme cases, but Lit Element, we're going to talk more about that. So my journey with Lit Element and Redux, fantastic, uh, until it wasn't. So we got into multi-threading. And multi-threading with Redux is a difficult thing to do. Um, you've got a worker state, and you've got a client state. Redux is based on copies of your state, as well as value-driven um, changes, value-driven updates. With runtime, we are difference-driven updates and change-based uh, updates. So we we're saying, OK, we've got a change on our worker. Well, we're not going to copy that, serialize it, and send it to the main thread. We're just going to send the changes. Uh, and additionally, Redux, um, it can become hard when you need to compose microstates, right? So uh, say you've got a group of tabs, and they need to share uh, states with each other in a tab uh, component. You're not going to use Redux for that. I mean, that would be crazy. All right. Uh, cons also. There's a lot of learning with Redux. There's a lot of boilerplate, uh, boilerplate stuff. Um, dev tools, time traveling, those are some of the positives. They're very you know, ingrained in what you probably already use. All right. Then um, after my pains with Redux and macro states, uh, I got what I needed to do. The first version of Mesh was built with Redux. Um, and I said, I need something more flexible. I need something um, a little more precise. And so I, I started to study RxJS. RxJS is great. Um, you know, reactive programming is awesome. Angular, they use that a lot. And I said, OK, it's awesome for micro states. It's awesome for uh, component to component choreographies. Um, it's less boilerplate and uh, you know, flexibility, great. So worker, client, no problem. The issue is that there's a lot of learning overhead. You've got a whole different kind of way of thinking with RxJS um, and some of the, 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 the high level construct uh, ideas. Um, and then, of course, you got to make sure you don't have memory leaks, so on and so forth. So we said, OK, RxJS, Redux, two great things. How do we take both of them, abstract them out to a pattern, and then use them uh, in one way or another to achieve the problem at hand? Patterns are awesome in web components. Um, they make your apps fast, and they don't add to your bundle size. Purple pattern, app shell, mediator pattern, these are some of the things that I've used deeply, um, and they, they help you out a lot. Today. Managers and the component controller model is our focus. So bringing it down from the whole application state and focusing on delivering that, that app and turning it into an experience and a presentation uh, on the main thread. So managers just simply manage large groups of controllers. And you can think of controllers as a split version of the application state. So the controller is, or of the component state. The controller is that component state, and a manager manages many component state. Um, and they work together. So uh, managers are essentially the solution to Redux and 
Uh, controllers on a micro level are the solution to RxJS. Um, they go hand in hand. And I'm just trying to bring it down to the specifics of uh, UI stuff here. So one of the largest challenges with building web applications is, again, as I alluded to, managing that experience and that presentation while still dealing with the underlying uh, data flows and computations there, especially keeping really valuable uh, main thread resources available for uh, interactions, user events, and animations. All right. So the component controller model, what is this? Um, in short, it is you have an object, a data object, that is injected into your component. The component now has access to that data object, and perhaps you want to have the controller be able to uh, co uh, communicate with the component. You can bind a callback or things like that. But in a very fundamental state, it's just an object that gets injected into a component. And uh, state management systems can access that object, and the component can access that object. This is a, it's a very nice um, thing for flexibility. Um, so a benefit of this is that you have your DOM, and your DOM is kind of like a tree, you know? And Redux, the way that um, changes are propagated through is kind of like a trickle-down system. However, in this example, in the DOM tree, you can see that I have component or uh, child D and child C. And what if I want child D and C to talk to each other? Well, if you're trickling down an entire state and you have a change in, in the data that affects child C, you need to now trickle it down so it hits C and D. Um, with the component controller model, you can actually connect those controllers ahead of time and allow your data layer to operate as if it's a graph uh, rather than being dependent on trickle-down data flows of the DOM. This is a very powerful thing. We, we do this in a couple of ways inside of runtime, but conceptually, this is uh, just a, a thought. So another benefit of uh, the component controller model is a performance gain. So we need performance because we're trying to run animations. We're trying to run uh, you know, user interactions, right? So how do we do that? Differential rendering. So I'm going to show you guys a, a little demo that I built here that basically shows what differential rendering is. And differential rendering is that because you have access to these component states before they're injected into the component, you have basically uh, an O of 1 capability to cause that component to update and re-render without side effects. So in a standard tree, Redux-like environment, you have trickle-down. And trickle-down is where you basically update the parent. Uh, so I'm going to try and update this first child here from the parent. And you can see, OK, this parent render changed, and this child render changed. So I can do that again, and you got four or five, so on and so forth. And you can start to see there is a, there's, a, there's a relationship between the parent and the child. In differential rendering, we are actually able to have O of 1 rendering where from the parent, um, any number of uh, nodes in depth, I can actually O of 1 differentially render that child, which is a pretty powerful thing because I have access to that data layer before and independently of uh, DOM uh, integration. So yeah, that's kind of what differ differential rendering is. Um, I'll take questions after, but yes, absolutely, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Um, all right, so just want to talk about the flexibility of lit element in the component controller model. So lit element, fantastic, um, great dev experience. However, we ran into cases where we want dedicated time for data to interact with each other and kind of create a boot up. So if you're in an app, you've got state changes from the router, you want that, those router state changes to, say, affect your data before render even happens. So when render does happen, the arrival of that data is, is good, that data is set. Um, and so you can allow data to interact beforehand. Um, also, we wanted to reduce DOM dependency and DOM uh, interactions, and that's an important thing. And the flexibility. With the component controller model, you can actually have one controller injected into multiple components and have a singleton pattern. This is really good for distributed components like indicators, where you want it to affect both components but only have a single source of truth. Uh, as you guys may or may not know, Web components actually do not uh, allow for a singleton pattern. If you try and do it, it'll throw an error. Um, so this is helpful. And also, you can now uh, incrementally upgrade your applications um, because a difficulty, for example, with React and web components is that React can't really bind to web components directly. However, if you have a middleman data layer, um, you can actually affect that object, and then the object would affect the uh, web component. So it makes it much easier to get out of the gate 
um, and not really have to wait on frameworks to come support it. However, uh, frameworks have great support for web components, and that's evolved tremendously uh, over the past. So this is a, a life cycle, and it's kind of hard to read. Um, I apologize for that. However, points one through six is all data. So the unique thing here is um, all of your controllers are initialized. All the controllers have um, interactions with each other. They can be linked to each other. Um, and this all happens before point six, where the lit element lifecycle should update triggers, and then a render happens as well. So the point here is that data boot up should be separate from element and component boot up. And element and component boot up should truly be for styles, animations, um, and the actual presentation of that component. Data boot up happens separately. Nice. All right. So component controller model. I'm going to show you guys an advanced uh, controller here, which is part of the runtime platform. And this is a toggle controller. This controller is basically the state of the toggle, as well as some additional stuff. So you can see here we've got a toggled property, and I'm setting it to this.enabled, which might be enabled sent from the database or somewhere else. Um, and you can see also uh, our controllers support synthetic slots and injected styles. The unique thing here is that sometimes slots can get in the way of the flexibility that you're trying to, uh, or the, the thing that you're trying to do. Slots can kind of be a barrier uh, to styles and, and themes, in, in my experience. So um, what we do here is we actually say, hey, if you have a template, we can also send styles with that. And as well, our templates support the CSS uh, result array from lit element, and that's really nice. And then, of course, the benefit is just, hey, toggles passed into this template function, and I can just render that um, inside. So there's the injectable styles and the synth synthetic slots and injectable styles right there. OK, another thing. So developer experience. Uh, when I was building a large application, we had a new feature. We were like, OK, let's add this feature. Now we have to go everywhere where data was binding, like common features, and add that again. right? So this kind of happens um, all, all the time, and you don't really think about it. But say you know, we've got dark mode accessible and theme. Maybe I want to pass a mobile property. Well, now I've got to go add four bindings to these components and make sure internally the components understand that. Bindings are cheap, so it's not necessarily a performance thing here. However, it's a developer experience. So with the component controller model, I can abstract those bindings into a single object and then actually inject that single object into the component. And now the component uh, has those shared properties as well as any specific properties. So you can see uh, from a developer experience, we've just reduced 12 bindings to three. And additionally, uh, for kind of legacy components or components that might not support controllers yet, you can still do you know, uh, single property pass-ins. Nice. Okay. This is a standard component uh, data event. So basically, you have a toggle, and that toggle has changed, gone from true to false. Um, to do that, you need a render. You need to add an event listener. In this case, simple toggle has a toggle changed event, which binds to the toggle updated function. Then I need to extract the detail of that custom event, uh, components or custom events, and I need to get the value. Um, in our case, we send old and new, because we're a change-driven architecture, uh, as well as lit element. That's where we got the inspiration from. Um, and so that's the benefit. Now, what happens if you need to listen to those changes uh, without a render happening? What we can do is we can set up a new toggle controller, and I can pass in a toggle change callback, which would then just fire locally and call that toggle updated. And then render is down here, where I'm just passing in the controller whenever I'd like to. I actually don't have to wait on render uh, to get those updates and affect other data, uh, other controllers. So that's that toggle change callback right there. And of course, it's firing the uh, toggle thing. So yeah, um, runtime.dev, we're releasing a large part of it. And this is basically um, everything you could need to build a high performance uh, web components focused application. It's a platform. You can use some of it. You can use all of it. We ship routers, I mean, virtualization technology components. And it's a, it's a new experience. I, I had the benefit of, of experimenting uh, with all of these technologies through school, and then just re-envisioning this um, in, the, in the context of web components. So yeah, uh, there's a lot to be had, and there's, there's a lot to talk about. So I'd love to take chats off thread, but that is my presentation. Um, yeah. All right, cool.